Well, so here's how we're going to start. A lot of people get nervous on taking care of their hot tubs because they think it's going to be like a pool and they think it's going to have a lot of extra steps and issues and problems. I'm going to reassure you, it's not that tough. An amazing part about hot tubs are you don't have a lot of the variables you see in a pool. You don't have the sun, you don't have rain, you don't have debris. So it's really pretty easy. A big issue that people have is they overthink it. Um, I always make the joke, hopefully nobody works here at the water department. Those are the people who tend to take the most time in trying to balance their stuff because they really go uh, much more granular than they need to. So I'm going to start off with kind of the basics here. One of the first things, whether you're using salt, whether you're using chlorine on a smart chlor with a little floater, or whether you've got an older system that just uses like chlorine tablets, no matter what you do, you're going to be using test strips, you're going to be using pH increaser and decreaser, no matter what, okay? One of the most important things about keeping a hot tub in good shape and also making it last is keeping the pH and alkalinity and the testing correct. Um, not everybody covers that. I spent a long time as a service technician and I've seen a lot of people cause harm to their hot tubs because they didn't test the water. You've got to make sure that when you're going out there, it's recommended once a week, okay? And I'll, I'll reiterate that. You should really be doing it every week. Sometimes people who have like a seasonal house up in the mountains, on a lake, something like that, they might not be able to get there quite as often. You just want to do it literally as much as you can. And you're going to get one of these little litmus strips. Everybody who has a hot tub, you've got these things already. But if you don't have one, you're going to get this in your kit. Now, all depending on what type of tub you've got, they might look a little bit different, but they're all going to do the same thing. You've got your little test strip, and it's as simple as just take the strip, you're going to dip it in the water, you're going to pull it out, and you're going to match up the colors, okay? On the chart, no matter what, I wanted to do pH and alkalinity first, you're going to have okay ranges on here. It's going to tell you for alkalinity, they want you to be roughly between a 40 and a 120. For a pH, you want to be between 7.2 and 7.8. Most of the time, uh, water out of the tap in our areas, you know, I'd say around Portland, Buxton, stuff like that, if it's like municipal water, and even most wells, it's usually pretty good right out of the tap, right? So you're starting with good water. If anybody here has a house way up in the mountains and you've got a, an old well, you got stuff like that, you might be a little off, your pH might be a little higher, if you've got a big water softener style system on your house already, your pH might be a little bit lower. So it's good when you first have the tub filled, you wanna test the water and see what this says on pH and alkalinity. Now the good news about this is, it's easy to maintain and manage it, right? It's not gonna take a lot of effort to do it. You're dipping the strip in, you're checking what the pH and alkalinity is, and the cure if you're too high or too low, is as simple as spa down. If your pH and alkalinity is too high, spa up if your pH and alkalinity is too low. <clears throat> now, when I'm talking about all these different things, I'm giving you mainly tubs recommended procedure for maintaining it. I say that because on the back of these bottles, it's gonna give you certain dosages and suggestions. In the owner's manual on the hot tub that you get, it's also going to have a bunch of suggestions. You can go on, you know, YouTube, you can go online, you can find 100 people saying 100 different things. We have found over the years with the 40,000 people that we've helped with their hot tubs that our method tends to work the best, right? So I just wanted to make that clear. Everything that I'm giving you is also going to be available in cut sheets at the end. Um, you know, we're just trying to make it simple. So. On this pH and alkalinity thing, no matter what you use as your sanitizer, you've got to pay attention to that. You've got to be sure that it's all set up. Your test strips that you have, as well as all the chemicals, should be stored in a dry area. So don't put them outside in a, you know, if you've got like one of those uh, duck boxes, or if you've got an outside cabinet or something like that, don't keep your chemicals outside. You want to keep those indoors somewhere dry, you don't want to put it somewhere that's crazy humid. You don't want to let them freeze because they're going to lose their potency. Okay. So our pH and alkalinity are, again, my opinion, our most important things. It's being sure that we keep those levels correct. And again, we're just 
We're just going off what our test strip says, okay? The other thing that's gonna be important in the hot tubs, and this has been a more recent thing that's come out. Sure. That's a great question. Anytime you're gonna do anything on your chemicals, I personally have always given it like an hour. And the reason I've done that is it's given it time to properly mix. It's given it time to you circulate through the water. The other thing that I do is whenever you add any chemicals to the hot tub, you want to open the cover up all the way, you wanna turn the jets on, and you wanna let the jets run with the cover open. Now a lot of people, won't do that or they don't know, you know, to avoid that uh, type of situation. When you add chemicals to the water, there's always some type of a reaction, right? And those chemicals are gonna give off a gas and the gas has to go somewhere. If you just shut the cover every time, it traps the gases inside and you start to get a breakdown of the cover itself. Um, if you've ever been over at someone's house and their cover kind of had like a musty smell to it, or maybe those of you who have a hot tub, that's what your cover has. A little heavier, has a musty smell. That's likely because all those, all those gases have had nowhere to go and they just absorb into the cover, right? So when you add the chems, I would personally hit the jets, let it run, and then come back and test it a little bit later. You also don't want to get into the hot tub Again, for at least an hour after adding the chemicals. Um, if you have real sensitive skin, you might want to wait a little bit longer just because any of those chemicals, whether it's a pH or whether it's a chlorine or whatever, sometimes those chemicals can cause a little bit of irritation on the skin. And if anybody else has any questions as I'm going, you know, feel free to ask. pH and alkalinity. Yep. Aren't they the same thing? So yes, yes and no. In a pool, you tend to see a lot more variance between those two, where let's say after, after you have a heavy rain, you'll notice that the alkalinity will uh, plummet, but the pH will stay the same. In the hot tub, they, they're almost always on the same level. So when you're testing, and I'm talking about them being in the okay range, 99% of the time, when you test the water, your pH, if it's low, your alkalinity is gonna be low. If your pH is high, the alkalinity is going to be high, right? They tend to drift in sequence. Every now and again, you can get to a, a case where they're split, meaning your pH is low and your alkalinity is high, or vice versa. Anytime you get to a case like that, it's usually after the water is old, right? It's been there too long. That's always kind of like my mark when I know I need to drain it and refill it. I'll drain it, I'll refill it, I'll start fresh. Certain times we've seen people who've, and this is again, very, very rare, so I don't wanna make anybody nervous about this, but I've seen certain rare cases where somebody, and it's always due to their water quality at their house, their pH might be okay, but their alkalinity might be low. There are ways of leveling those off. We usually recommend that people take their pH and alkalinity down to a low level at once, and then bring them both up together. So if you came in and you said, hey, my pH is okay, or it's a little low, but my alkalinity is high, I would have you add this product, which is the down, which on it says decreases pH and total alkalinity. I would have you essentially, if I'm pH and alkalinity, I would have you add the down because it's gonna bring them both down to a flat level. Then I can have you add a little bit of up to bring them both up together, okay? But it's, it's much more prevalent to have like separately related problems with pH and alkalinity in pools. And not everybody explains that as much. And a lot of people who've had pools, they assume it's gonna you know, work the same way. Again, not having the variables in the hot tub, it kind of helps us out, so. When you say damage it, damage the motors, damage the, the tub itself, what, everything. what does it damage? It damages everything. Having low, having low pH is very acidic, right? you start to eat away at the bearings and the seals and the gaskets and the jet faces and pretty much everything. Now, that isn't to scare anybody and say that you know, one day of low pH is gonna cause everything to fall apart. It takes a little bit of prolonged abuse in order for that to happen. But nonetheless, it can be very, very, very damaging. In my time doing this, people who have had their hot tubs last the longest took a lot of time in being sure pH and alkalinity was balanced correctly. 
and the people who might get the tub and never test it, and pH is always low, it's going to cause premature failure on some of the components. So it is very important to check that. So I think you've applied this, but solve that first before you address chlorine. I recommend doing all that first. That way, you're That's starting off with these two. That's lead off. Yep. Now, I'm going to go a little bit more into that next. I want to get into the sanitizers because it all kind of ties together. But that's what I like to start with, right? Make sure everything's correct. Did you say open the cover, run the jets before adding chemicals? Is it okay to do the test strip without that? So you want to, you want to open up the cover and test the water. And then when you add the chemicals, you want the cover to be open yep, yep. and jets running in order for those gases to be released into the air. Okay. Because if you go out there and you add the chemicals and then just shut the lid, yeah, it's yeah. all that stuff's getting churned up. So testing is fine without doing that stuff. Exactly. Okay. If you're just going out there to check your hot tub and you just want to open the lid and test it, okay. you can do that totally. It's, it's all about allowing those gases to escape and also preventing any undissolved chemicals from splashing up on the bottom of the cover too. Okay. Because a lot of this stuff really, you know, pH down, it's a powdered acid, it right? It will, it will cause stuff to, you know, degrade. Do you just dump the chemicals in or do you sprinkle So that's a great question. Actually, I'm going to open this up. Is that okay? Would you mind? When I'm going to add chemicals to this thing, I will always have it all the way open. And I'm actually going to stay up. Oh, thank you very much. Inside, when I'm testing it, I can just test anywhere in the water, okay? When I add chemicals, I go into the filter area. Now, yours might look a little bit different, but it's essentially where the filters are located on the tub. That's where you want to pour the chemicals in and you want to have the jets running. The reason we have you pour them in there is because then it's being sucked into the system, mixed, and distributed out on all the jets. If I was to just take a cap of this stuff and throw it into the water, I would risk that it would sink and sit there on the bottom undissolved, okay? So you always want to, you want to pour it into the filter housing. Is it okay to have the filter out while, while it's cleaning? Or that wouldn't have, yeah, that'd be fine. That's not going to have any effect on that. So you can, any tub can run without a filter in it for a short amount of time, right? You wouldn't want to just have a tub without a filter going on weeks or something like that. But if you had to take it out overnight and clean a filter, it's fine to let it run that way. And it's fine to actually have the filter in there and pour the chemicals and have it go through that. That's also not going to cause a problem. So does anybody have any more questions about the pH and alkalinity right now? Nope. All right. So we'll go on to the next. The other thing that we're going to talk about, and this is something that's come up more recently, it didn't used to be as prevalent in our industry, are the phosphates in the water. Okay. So what happens you've got a certain level in some, some water sources. And, and eerily, there's no real way to tell where it's at, meaning if it's municipal water, if it's, if it's water from your well, it could be anywhere. Uh, I live down in wells. I don't have any phosphates in my water. It's very lucky. But my in-laws live over in Sanford. They got a ton. What phosphates are is they're essentially, it's, a, it's an item that's in the water that could be added through your water uh, purification plant. It could be left in your groundwater from old like fertilizer that was in farmland. Th typically with phosphates, it was more prevalent in the pool industry because you would see people who lived on farms and they would have their uh, fields sprayed with chemicals and the runoff would make their way into the pool. What phosphates do is they eat chlorine. If you have a lot of phosphates in the water, you will never be able to establish a chlorine reading. So we want people to also at the beginning, either when they first get their tub or when you first fill it up, you want to test for the phosphates. Now it's very easy. And when you test for these phosphates, this isn't something that you're going to have to do all the time, right? Like on a, on a once a week basis. When I fill my hot tub up initially, I just drained mine a couple weeks ago. I filled it up. I tested for this stuff. I didn't have to add anything. Now, I will likely test it again here, maybe in a month or two, just to see if I've had any residuals come into the tub. Because phosphates can also come from if you've got uh, certain body products on your skin, if you've got any detergents left in your suits and your clothes, if you've got certain uh, like you know hair products that haven't washed out. You could have phosphates in those items. 
Now again, that's not, it's not as, as common of a thing, um, but I just want to prepare everybody for any possible scenario. When I'm testing for this stuff, this is a pretty easy test in that I'm not really having to, having to dip stuff as much. I'm just taking this little test tube, and when I do it, I'm gonna fill it up with some water. And you can even, like for those of you who are, who haven't gotten your tubs yet, or haven't filled them yet, you can always test that in advance. You can test your water just right out of your tap, right? Because that's the water you're gonna be filling it with. There's a little line on here, and I'm gonna fill it up right to that line with water. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one strip out of this little container. And when you see it, it's a long strip. If everybody can see that. It's got this big, long pad on it. The way you do it is you fold it in half, you stick it in the little cap, then you put it inside of this little test tube, you hold it, and you want to invert it and let the bubble go. I usually do three times. Yep. So once I'm done, I pull it out and I've got my mixture here. What you end up doing is you, you take your chart here, which has different colors on it, right? Uh, shades of blue and beige. And I actually take it and I look down through the tube and I match up my colors. So when I look at this, ours is perfect. Now we take a lot of time on maintaining these, but you might look down yours and it might be blue. The bluer it is, the more phosphates you've got in the water. Now I hope when all of you go to fill your hot tub and start it that you look and it's at zero, right? Because then it's easy. It means you're lucky you're not gonna have to mess with it. If you do look down this and you see that you've got some blue into the water, we had a customer come in earlier today, his was probably about a 500, okay? So not all the way to the top, but pretty close. He panicked a little bit. We said, no worries, it's not a big deal. All you've got to do is you get this thing of phosphory, which comes with all of your chemical packages. You'll get one of these no matter what. And on the back, you've got your dosages. Are, they're really based on uh, volumes of 10,000 gallons. Now, none of you have a 10,000 gallon hot tub. You're probably somewhere between three and 500 on your gallonage. So you're typically looking at between a quarter and a half of a cap of this liquid, and you just pour it right into the tub. That's if you've got phosphates in the water. You add that, you hit the jets, let it mix, and then I always recommend to retest just to see where you are, okay? After an hour. After an hour. Now, again, not everybody's gonna need this, okay? And I always get the question of people who get their hot tub and they've got all these chemicals in the bucket, because that's what it is, it's a big white bucket. And they think, oh my gosh, I got all this stuff, I have to use it all. Well, no, we're giving it to you because we don't want you to buy a hot tub and then have to run out and buy something else, right? We'd rather give you everything that you could need, you know, upfront. And if you need it, great. If you don't need it, you know, also great. That's gonna make it easier. So does anybody have any questions on the phosphates? You can underdo it and just not add enough, which would just mean you'd have to test and add more. Overdoing it, not really. Um, your risk to adding too much of this stuff into the water is that you might get a little water line. You might notice that you've got, um, I don't want to say like a scummy water line, you know, but it might be like a beige uh, line at the water. Nice. So yeah, it's almost like, kind of like grease a little bit, but you would have to add a lot for that. So again, you just want to work with capfuls. Um, I mean, I've met some people who just go out to their hot tub, they don't measure anything, and they just pour it. Please don't do that, right? Please don't do that. This stuff's not cheap, and you're just, you want to be soaking in water, not chemicals, okay? So try to minimize what you need to do. So for a town that has typically a little higher phosphates, like South Portland, yep. that we're in, um, test more regularly? If you're adding more water. Right, because you gotta remember, phosphates are only gonna be introduced into the water either through your source water, meaning if you lose water in the tub and have to refill it, or if you got a bunch of stuff on your skin. Um, I will say, in my time doing this, if you, have, if you have a bunch of kids in there, 
or if you, if somebody here has a teenage daughter and she's got six of her friends over and everybody's partying in the hot tub, be prepared to probably have to add some of this stuff because it's unlikely you're going to be able to, to, to convince them to shower off heavily and rinse their hair and do all that stuff before getting in the hot tub. Well, mm -hmm. we, won't get to we won't get to there. That's, <laughs> that's class two. So does anybody have any more questions on the phosphates? Is it different for fresh water and solid water? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. What I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about all the basic stuff, whether you have fresh water or salt water, that's going to be the same across the board. Okay? Then we're going to go into salt and chlorine you know, individually. So another thing that we're going to be testing for on these strips is a hardness level. Okay? That's all the way on the bottom. Uh, hardness slash calcium. Again, it's one of those things that you test at the beginning right, when you first fill it up. Right away, like on the day you get your hot tub, you're going to probably spend maybe 15, 20 minutes testing the water, checking all the stuff, making sure you've added everything and getting it going. That's going to be the day that you're doing the most work. After that, it's really easy because you're just checking it the once a week and adding stuff as needed. Again, I'm saying this because I don't want anybody to panic and think that this is difficult. It really shouldn't be. I mean, it should be one of those, you know, three to five minutes a week, I dip a strip in, I see what I'm doing, and that's what I got to do. To talk about hardness, hardness is important across the board. It's important in salt tubs, it's important in chlorine tubs. It's your, it's essentially the level of like the calcium hardness in the water. If you've got city or town water, you're probably going to be about perfect, just right off the bat. You know, if you're talking Portland, Scarborough, anything like that, you're going to be great. Um, Again, I'm down in wells, I'm on a well, I'm lucky, mine is great also. People who are up in the mountains, people who have older homes with older wells, stuff like that, you might notice that you've got a really, really high level of hardness in the water. The risks to that is you have a lot of calcium that's going to try to build up on the surface of the tub, on the shell, as well as it's going to coat your heating element, it could get into the pumps, it's just go it's going to create a sandpaper-like feel, okay? That's like the worst case. That's the worst thing that it does. Um, but still, it's bad because it makes some of the parts uh, prematurely die. The other thing that it does is it doesn't allow the chemicals to perform as well, especially with salt systems. A salt system has to have a certain hardness reading, which is why it's got a little thing on here that says salt okay and then okay because if you have a hardness level that's too high and you're using a salt tub, your salt cells, right, your thing that makes the salt system work, are not going to perform as efficiently. If your salt is, or if your hardness is too low on the same respect, your cartridge isn't going to perform as efficiently. It's not going to work. So you've got to keep it within that sweet spot, which on salt, we're talking 25 to 75. On chlorine or otherwise, we're talking like 25 to 150. Now again, most people, if I, if I looked at 100 people's test results at their house, spread about our area up here in Maine, maybe one or two of them is going to have a hardness issue, but the rest are going to be okay. So it's not a common thing. What we've got here is there's two things to address it, which you'll get in your kit. One of them is this thing, which is called a vanishing act. This helps to reduce your uh, calcium hardness level in the water. The other one is an increaser, calcium hardness increaser. It works the same way. This is going to take it down, and this is going to take it up. You're doing this at the beginning, when you're first filling it up again. Even if you had to add an inch or two of water here or there, that's really not going to, it's not going to affect it enough to make you have to do all this again. So just remember, this is what you're doing when you first fill it up. What this is inside of here, it looks like a big like pumice bag, right? It's a big white pillow looking thing. What you're doing with that is in the bottom of all of your hot tubs, you're going to have a drain, right? Something down there that looks like water's being pulled into it. You're going to take this and you're going to put it in the bottom of the tub. And there's actually a really good video that explains all this. We've got a lot of literature that explains all this. Uh, when our guys come out and deliver the hot tub, they explain all this. You drop it in the bottom. Typically, people leave it in there. I've seen most people do it for 24 hours, depending on how high your levels are. 
If you test it and your levels are off the charts, you're totally gonna have to leave it for that long. If you test it and your levels aren't that high, you might be able to leave it in for you know, three, four hours and then pull it out and check it and see what happens. What this bag is essentially doing is it's kind of absorbing that uh, calcium into it, okay? You've got to get that part right, otherwise everything else is just going to be more difficult, right? So if you're doing what I'm saying, it's really going to make your lives a lot easier. The other side is the up. If you test it and your hardness levels are really low, or I'm sorry, if they're really, yeah, if they're really low, you're going to have to add a little bit to boost it. Now by a little bit, I'm talking about like a capful, right? It's not going to be much. And you just pour it into the filter housing like everything else. And it dissolves and it brings your levels up and you can retest and you can see where you're at. Now, everybody here, if you run into a situation where you have a question with your water, you don't understand it, you can give us a call, you can bring a water sample in and we'll test it for you. We find that most people, for the first couple weeks, they're learning how to get it going. Once they've used it for a couple weeks and done a couple tests, it's like clockwork. Right. I mean, I, I would really stress to say that I spend much more than like three minutes a week. I do it every Sunday, walk out there, test it, add what I got to add, and I'm good. Does anybody have any questions about the hardness? I have a question on the caps. So the, I've got the kit and there's all kinds of different things, but some things might be heavier than others. So when it says add an ounce or whatever, like I don't have to scale at the ski house. So sure. Is everything usually a cap full? No. Your capsules vary, right? So with liquids, I don't know the best way to say this. With liquids, it's a shot glass full. Right. That's essentially what you're looking at. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 you can talk, you can <laughs> Usually with the powders, I see most people using like a tablespoon measurement, like a tablespoon, right? Okay. And what you can do, um, I'm not sure whether this is sanctioned or not for the camera, but what you can do is you can measure it out once right? Measure out your dose. You can pour it into the cap and yeah. see how much of the cap it's taking up. Mm -hmm. That's going to tell you how much you need in the future. We don't have to get right down to the granular, measure it down to the gram or anything like that. We're just looking for close. So, so hardness is only an issue in the beginning? Yep. Okay. Yeah. The only reason you would have to deal with it later on would be, again, if for some reason you, you had a bunch of people over and they splashed out half the water and you had to refill it, that's really the only way more hardness is being introduced into the water, would be from that. So, where are you guys at, roughly, of what town? Hollowell. Hollowell. Well, on a well or on township? Uh, we, have, we have our, the city has a well okay. um, in Chelsea. Okay, so your, if there's any sort of like municipal water management, they do a great job of taking the hardness out. It, it's, I've never seen a municipal water source have calcium problems like really bad, okay? It's always been wells or people that have really advanced home water filtration systems, like softeners, because they take the hardness out and they soften the water too much. Mm -hmm. Then you end up with a really low level in the water. So. I got a quick, yeah. quick, when I add things into mine, I, I've been doing it on, I push the clean button, Yep. which makes, you know, <coughs> where I add it, is that, is that the right way to do it, or should I do it with jets on? Totally fine. Your clean cycle is the jets. Yeah. Um, not everybody here might have it, but you, if you do have a button, or you have an option that says clean on your control panel, that turns on the jets for 10 minutes, and it uses one of your pumps on a high speed in order to rapidly filter and circulate the water. And that shuts off after 10 minutes. Oh, so you have to return to it. Yeah. Exactly. The other good news is if all of you have hot tubs from us, or if, if all of you have a hot tub that was bought in the last decade, you know, pretty much from anywhere, all the pumps have an automatic turnoff function, right? Where they either will stay on for a half an hour or an hour. It can't just run in perpetuity forever. A lot of the older tubs would do that. Like you could forget about it and you came back a week later and it'd still be running. Now it'd be red hot, but it'd still be running. So it will shut off automatically. Any more questions about the hardness? If there's a lot of iron in the water up in the mountains, iron and hardness, anything similar or not? They are. There's actually, I'll wait for one of my friends here to come back, there's a gadget that if you've got a lot of metals in the water, there's this gadget that you call gadgets is going to last you for the next 20 times you've got to fill the hot tub up. 
And it's really, really helpful, really helpful. Anybody who's got metals in the water, you should do one of those. Because you're making the investment once in this $100 tube gadget that is going to minimize what you've got to deal with with you know, metal dropout in the water, water lines. It's going to help to keep your filter from staining up as much, all that stuff. This is that thing I was talking about, it's a clean screen. You pull it out, it's just this giant white tube. You screw it on the end of your garden hose, set it on the edge, and you just let it fill. Inside of this is a sand-like material. It's an engineered media that pulls out a lot of the metals prior to it even making its way into the tub. So if anybody's up in the mountains, if you're on a well, um, any of that stuff, this is totally worth its weight in gold. And again, you buy one of them and it's good for 10,000 gallons. When you're done, you don't want to leave it outside by the hot tub because it will freeze and crack. You just want to take it inside, set it in the basement, anything like that. So on to the next part, which is our sanitizer. Either way you go, whether you're using a salt water system or whether you're using a chlorine system, which would be one of these guys, you're, you're using chlorine. A salt system is just making its own natural chlorine out of the salt. The benefit of making natural chlorine out of the salt is you don't have the, like all the byproducts and you don't have like the dry skin feel, you don't have the chlorine smell, you don't have any of that. Chlorine has been around forever. Salt systems have been around in, let's say, the pool and spa industry for probably about 30 years. To this day, to my knowledge, there's still only one manufacturer that makes a saltwater hot tub. It's the ones that we have. A lot of that's because it takes, it takes a great deal of thought to make a system like this that's going to work, that's going to keep the water sanitary so you feel comfortable getting into it. Whether you're using a salt system or you're just using chlorine itself, you have to keep a chlorine level in the water because that's what's keeping it sanitary. That's why the water stays clear. If you didn't have any chlorine in the water, it would turn cloudy, it would turn hazy. You'd kind of get that smell like a fish tank. You want to avoid that. I'm going to start talking about regular chlorine first and then I'm going to go into the salt at the end because the salt, in my opinion, is a little bit easier. When you're talking about chlorine, depending on what type of hot tub you guys have, there's going to be really three types of chlorine systems. One of which is just going to be granulized chlorine, which is just you're putting scoops in it at a time. Usually when people are going on a system like this, they're testing it once a week, adding a little bit, and then they add a little sprinkle when they get out. If everybody here has reasonably newer hot tubs or everybody who hasn't taken delivery of theirs, you're totally gonna have like one of these two versions because these are the, are the newest, latest, and greatest, and easiest. Instead of, of you having to manually add stuff, they've put it into these little pods and these little cartridges. If you've got what's known as an inline system, you've got two of these little cartridges that stick inside of a little hopper. It's a little cylinder that goes down into the tub. Your chlorine one is good for about a month. Your blue one, which is the mineral, is good for about four months. On the tops of the cartridges, there's a dial. And on here, it's set to zero right now. As I turn this top, it's gonna to go from zero up to six. Typically, people keep them at a two. That's just a slow dispensing into the water. That way, it's an even flow, kind of like an IV drip. You're just constantly adding a little bit at a time into the water. If you've got these, it's it's really the easiest style of chlorine system that you could get just because it's taking the variable out of the equation, which is the variable being you, adding the chemicals all the time and having to do it. Um, a lot of our ski home crowd, a lot of the Airbnb crowd, stuff like that, they love these because it's constantly adding it. If you got a ski home and you're there every other week, nobody's there to add that little bit of chlorine on the off time, right? And this is doing it. So... I don't believe you, so you've got a salt tub, I believe. No, I no, you don't? Okay. So on a tub, you're going to have a little hopper. There's going to be a little circular top, and there's going to be a handle. Is there a way you could grab me one of those? I think there's one on the TX right there. you don't have it on your tub. So if you don't, then you would use the ball. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that part next. I've got her grabbing this. Okay, so it's Some of the tubs are equipped with this. It's called the Addy's style system. The way this works is it's in a pressurized tank. And it's labeled minerals and smart chlor. Our mineral one pops into the top. Our smart chlor one pops into the bottom. We slide it down into the tube, lock it in place. 
and then it's just slow dispensing the chemicals out into the water. Not all tubs have these, right? And again, all based on what type of hot tub you've got. And after we're done, I can walk you guys around and show you, you know, kind of where these go. I can talk about the different styles of these different, you know, floaters and cartridges and whatnot. But these two are doing the same thing. One of them just has a hopper it sits in. One of them's just going to float around in the tub. The other version of this at ease style system is this little ball. And it looks just like the package. It's literally, it's a ball that floats around into the water. And there's two pieces to it. One of the pieces is blue, that's your mineral cartridge. The other one is a silver cartridge. I'm just gonna open this up so I can show it to you. And again, depending on what type of tub you've got, if you've got one of these, it'll come in your kit. The way these two pieces go together is there's a little knob in the center, almost like a little key. The keys line up, you drop it in, you click it, there we go then I can just throw this thing into the water. And it's slowly bobbing around and dispensing your chlorine and your minerals. If you have been using bromine, you can't use that. You have to wait until you dump the tub. Correct, the correct. If you mix chlorine and bromine, you end up with a really weird kind of Mountain Dew colored water. It, it has a very unique reaction. Um, startling at the first time you do it, but it will burn off. It's just not good for the systems. So if, you, if anybody has been using bromine, you wouldn't want to just immediately switch to chlorine. You've got to do a dump and a refill. So this little ball has the same type of thing I was talking about. This little thing on the bottom is a dial. I'm turning it up or down right now. Goes from, this one goes from an off up to a four. Okay? Either way you go, whether it's this or whether it's one of these little chlorine cartridges, that's based on the use and the size of the tub. This is a massive hot tub. I would probably never set up a ball any lower than a two on this, just because I have to at least have that much to keep all the gallonage ready. Now let's say, let's say you have a party and you've got 10 people over at your house using your hot tub. I'd turn it up a little bit because every single person that gets into the tub, stuff that's on their skin, stuff that's in their suit, stuff that's in their hair, whatever, it's gonna eat up a little bit of that chlorine, right? The more users in the water, the more chlorine or sanitizer is gonna be eaten up. So again, back to the conversation of having a bunch of kids in there, you're gonna wanna give it a little boost, right? And one of the best things with the hot tubs is preventative maintenance pays such dividends on this stuff. If you know you're gonna have a party, a bunch of people coming over, just be sure that you've got a good sanitizer level or after they get out, maybe give it a little boost of some chlorine. Because if you have a wild party with a bunch of people over, and then you don't check it for a day or two and you go out there, it's going to be awful. It just is going to be for sure. So you want to always check on that stuff. Now that's not a common thing, right? Not everybody's into having wild massive hot tub parties with a bunch of people. But if in the event you do, or your kids do, or whatever, make sure that you check it. So again, talking about this stuff, whether you've got the floating ball or whether you've got the little cartridges, that's what's essentially slow releasing that chlorine into the water and keeping it sanitary for you. The other thing that you're gonna get with either system is gonna be the powder chlorine. It's chlorine in granules. This is just a concentrated dose. This is like, it's like the shock, right? Now, even with a salt tub, you're gonna get this stuff because we still want you, even if you have a salt water tub, we want you to be able to add a little bit of chlorine boost if in the event you need it. Now, when I say a little, I'm just talking about like a teaspoon or two, right? Depending on how big your tub is. I know just having done this for so long that I can kind of pour it into the bottom. And if I just cover the bottom of the cap, that's about a teaspoon. I can just I toss it into the water. If I had a bunch of people over using my hot tub, let's say this evening, when they all left, I would give it a little boost. If you don't have one of these, either the uh, cartridges or the ball, you're going to need to, again, at least once a week, add a little bit of chlorine. Even if the water looks perfectly clear and everything's good, you still want to test it. A lot of people who have done this forever, they will just say, oh, well, the water looked good, so I didn't need to test it. Well, no, you've got to check it. You've got to make sure that it's clean, clear, pH is good, and all that good stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff that can happen if your water isn't, isn't chlorinated, right? If you don't have the proper sanitizer level in the water, it is not sanitary. That's like people you've heard of have like hot tub itch, 
um, stuff like that. That's from going in unsanitized uh, hot tubs. So you want to be careful. You had a question. Did you say you might use that even in a saltwater system? Correct. Okay. And I'm going to, as I go into the salt system, I'll talk about how to do that. That's the type of system that I have, and I'll kind of talk about how I, how I work it. Does anybody have any questions about the two, I'll say, types of chlorine delivery systems here? Or any questions in general about chlorine, how it works, how to do it? Do you recommend using shock? So the shock stuff is another chemical. It's, shock is like that term. It's typical, it typically means a non-chlorine oxygen type of shock, right? I do, I do recommend using it, and I do recommend using it on a regular basis. But again, that's going to really depend on what type of sanitizer system you run, how many people are using it. There's a lot more variables that play into that. And I'm going to get to that next after we get done with this. So on the chlorine, does anybody have more questions? Sorry, yeah. Uh, on this, the test, right? <coughs> yep. there's, there's um, bromine and then chlorine, right? And yep. It's one, two. Wrong so one. if you're, I mean, you're, you're ignoring the bromine if you're not a bromine. Correct. You're ignoring, you're ignoring that bromine yeah, no matter what. It'll show it because chlorine and bromine are so close to each other as chemicals. So, good example here is I can test this right now. We'll do a little dip. We'll match it up. Ours is a little higher than normal. I'm showing both bromine and a chlorine reading on the top, right? I would not ever pay attention to what the bromine says. I'm just looking at chlorine, which is the FCL. It's the second one down. Um, you want to keep it, again, within the okay range on the, on the sheet. Here's showing a three to a five. People who have a saltwater tub, most of the time, they're not keeping it quite that high. Usually people with salt tubs are keeping it between a one and a three, right? Because, and again, as I explained the salt systems, a, a salt tub's going to work a little bit different in how it's creating and delivering the sanitizer into the water. How many people here have a salt tub or are getting one? All right, so pretty good amount. The way a saltwater hot tub works, and it's the same in a saltwater hot tub or saltwater pool, you've got this little cartridge. Now this little cartridge is taking a saltwater molecule and it's breaking it apart. You're taking, essentially, NaCl. You're breaking off the Cl. You're making natural chlorine out of the salt. Now you're doing that at a certain level of intensity. When this is running, all your systems are gonna have what's known as an output setting. That output setting is gonna be a zero to a 10. That is how much use you're having and the frequency of engagement of the salt. I usually recommend people keep it around a five or a six on the output setting. When our guys come out and do their, uh, the orientations, and if you haven't had your hot tub delivered yet, we come out and deliver it. We give you an orientation on how to use it. Then we call you after you've had the hot tub for a couple weeks and see how you're doing, and you get one free visit within three months of it being delivered, where our guys come back out to your place and just make sure everything's going good. Answer any questions you've got, make sure you haven't screwed anything up, you know, that kind of stuff. We found people listen to about three quarters of what we say on the delivery day, and they're excited, and we know that. So we try to give you all the information we can with literature, with videos, um, you know, our guys who are orientate you are going to talk like I'm talking. Just explain it all down. Make sure you feel comfortable with it because that's really what we want. If you feel comfortable with using your hot tub and taking care of it, you're going to enjoy it a lot more than if you're worried about just winging it and not doing it right. So on this cell, it's creating that natural chlorine from the salt, okay? As water's passing through these blades, it actually energizes them. That's what's creating the split. When I talked about calcium and I talked about hardness issues and stuff like that, that all affects these cells. If you had too much calcium in the water, you're going to start to see a buildup on the cell. It's not going to work as well. If you have tons of phosphates in the water, it's eating the chlorine up as fast as this little cell can make it. Because that's all this is doing. It's not like delivering a heavy like, dose of chlorine into the water. It's just adding a little bit at a time. So when you asked about if, if you get chlorine with a salt tub, yes. Because when you first go to fill your hot tub up on day one, you're going to fill it up. You're going to let it get up to temperature. You're going to test all your stuff and make sure you're in a good spot with the pH and the hardness and phosphates. And then we're going to have you add a little bit of chlorine at the beginning in order to establish 
a residual chlorine reading. You have to start with clean, clear water because we don't know what kind of water you filled this with, right? If anybody's ever had a well uh, replaced at their house, they always uh, chlorinate the wells because they don't know what kind of water you're starting with. Same kind of idea. You got to be sure that you're starting with a sanitary body of water. So we're going to have you add, again, usually about a teaspoon on the first day of filling it up. That's going to establish a chlorine level. Now, chlorine naturally burns off from heat and from just overall use in keeping the water clean. So we have you add that little bit of residual chlorine that gets you at a good level. Then your salt system starts up. It starts making the chlorine and making the chlorine. Your chlorine level is going to burn down a little bit. And then the way it's supposed to work is then your salt system kind of takes over and then just starts making a little bit of chlorine at a time, right? It's just replenishing uh, what might burn off or what's been used. When I talk about the levels at which the uh, salt systems are set for, that is going to be based upon use. Again, if you're having wild, crazy parties and tons and tons of people in it, or if you're just out there using it all the time, right? Because you're using it for like medicinal reasons. The more use, the more bodies in the water, the higher you're really going to need that output setting in order to keep up with it. And on all the salt cells and systems, there's also going to be a function that's called a boost, right? If you've already had your hot tub delivered, you've seen that. If you don't, it's going to be on yours. It's going to say boost and it'll be an on or an off is your choice. What the boost does is it lets you, it takes your output level on your, on your salt system and turns it up to a 10, maxes it out, and it runs it at that 10 for 24 hours, and then it goes back to its original setting. So if yours is set at a four, and you push the boost button, it's gonna run at a 10, and then 24 hours later, it's gonna drop back down to a four. So when I have, if my kids have their friends over, or if my wife has her sisters over or whatever, and I have more people than normal in the hot tub. Everybody knows when they get out to push the boost button because that's just gonna help to clean it up, right? Again, like I said, preventative maintenance pays dividends. You take the time to be sure it's in good shape, make sure it's tested, make sure if you have heavy use, just add a little bit of extra sanitizer. On this system, these cells are good for roughly four months, right? That's the average lifespan that we see them last. Some people get more, some people get less. People who have really high uh, phosphate levels, people that have really high uh, calcium levels, hardness levels, you're not going to get as long, which, again, it makes it so important to be sure you get those things under control because it'll start to kill your cells off. I tend to get about like four and a half to five months out of mine. Now, my system is going to tell me that it's, it's time. It actually pops up a reminder on your screen that's going to say, replace salt cartridge, right? So it's really smart. Um, hot tubs have come a long way in the last 20 years. It'll remind you if there's a case like that. It'll remind you for a lot of things, but on the salt system, it's going to tell you when it's time to do it, right? Um, with these, most people will buy these on our auto ships where you basically sign up for it and one shows up at your door every four months. That way you don't have to mess around. Now, you've got a couple choices depending on the amount of use that you've got. You can do it a little bit more. You can do it a little bit less if you're a heavy user you can essentially have them shipped a little more frequently. If you aren't as heavy of a user, you can turn it down. So that's the easiest way. Uh, we sell them in the stores, we got them in three packs, we got them in single packs, anything you need. So, yep. On the screen, it says replace, like our brand there, it says replace salt cartridge at the bottom right. Yep. That doesn't mean replace, that's saying that's a button you hit. Exactly. To turn it off so you can pull it out or Yep, whatever. that is a great, great question and comment. It'll actually pop up on the screen. Like there'll be no way to escape the reminder. It's going to tell you on there that it's time to change it, and it's going to come up right on that screen. What you're talking about is really important, and I'm glad you brought that up. On there, when you go to change that cartridge, it's pressurized. If I opened this up right now, water would just spray all over the place because it's pressurized by a pump underneath. And what you're saying, you go in and hit that replace button, you've actually got to hold it down for about five seconds. It'll say, would you like to replace the cartridge? You say, yes. It'll say, powering off pumps. Wait, and then it'll say, remove salt cartridge. When you go through that step process, not only are you avoiding getting sprayed with a bunch of water, but you're also resetting the internal timer of the system, okay? 
I say this because some people, when it's time to replace their cartridge, they would just turn the breakers off on the house, shut power off to the tub, and then change the cartridge. Uh, that'd be me. <laughs> that'll work, that'll work, but then you're not resetting your timer, and then your hot tub has no idea if it's time to replace the cell or not, right? So you might be getting these, you know, like messages, it, which are telling you to replace the cartridge, and you think, oh, well, it must be dead. It's just a timed reminder, right? So anytime you change the cartridge, just follow the prompts, and once you've done it once, it's super easy, super, super easy. And then it just, it reminds you, it'll say starting backup system, it'll give you all those notes. So if the power goes out and rains like all the time, yep. um, is it resetting anything, or is this hot tub machine smart enough to know what to do? I would love to say that it's smart enough to know what to do. The problem with losing power, right, is that all hot tubs have to be on a GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter. They're looking for a very small variation in milliamps and it trips the breaker. When you get a power outage, if the power kind of browns out, if it, if it fades out and then fades back on, if it's choppy service, it's possible that it will trip that ground fault breaker. So you're saying the, the switch inside of the box? Yep. So now I'm not in Rangeley for two weeks and it's three degrees out. Yep. How long before this thing will freeze solid before I have to run out there? If it's one of these, and actually him and I had this conversation earlier. If it's, <laughs> if it's one of these, I had a problem. Yep. you're good if it's at 102, 103 degrees. You're good for probably three to four days at least because they're so well insulated. So my neighbors have a place up on the mountain and I set them up with this thing because they have a little bit older of a tub. They've got a little wireless thermometer that they've got mounted on the tub and, and they drop the little thermometer piece in the water and that way they can look on their phone and they can say, oh, it's not on. I know I've lost power. Or they can say, oh, I got power onto the house, but the hot tub's, you know, 60 degrees. The other thing that a lot of people do, and I brought it up to him earlier, is for 25 bucks you can go buy one of those cheap little Wi-Fi cameras. And most of the new hot tubs have an indicator display on the outside that shows it being on, right? You just have a little camera pointed out there that'll tell you how you're acting. Now on the newer hot tubs, and I mean newer, newer, like within the last couple years, they do make a monitoring system that you can have installed inside the hot tub. It's, it's a connected app system where there's a, basically a transmitter that gets installed inside the equipment housing and a transmitter that's, that's mounted by your router. What that does is you can bring your phone up and it'll show your hot tub what temperature it is. You can turn the jets on and off. You can do all that. A lot of people like that idea. It's not a free option because those transmitters and all the gadgetry is pretty expensive. It's actually about a thousand bucks to have one of these things put in. What a lot of people do is they think that it's more efficient to shut their hot tub temperature down when they're leaving and then turn the temperature back up when they get back. That is the absolute opposite of efficiency. The way these things are built and what gives them their you know, quality and efficiency standings is they hold the heat very, very, very well. And it's so much better. Even if he's got a place up on the mountain, he's there every other week. Leave it, just cruise at 102 degrees, just leave it there. Don't drop it down to 80 and then heat it up when he gets in town, just let it cruise. You're gonna spend so much more in energy if you are always dropping it and reheating it you also, if you've dropped your hot tub down to 80 degrees and you're gone and now you lose power, you don't have like three to four days at 80 degrees. You're going to freeze a lot quicker. So having the little Wi-Fi thermometer thing, having the camera or doing the connected app, all those are our solutions for this. Um, if a lot of people up there have housekeepers and cleaners and stuff like that, just ask them to check it. Say, hey, if anybody lost power up here, would you just go make sure the hot tub's on? You know, just go look and see if the screen lights up. That's not... Now that's the same thing I would say to everybody. Um, I, again, I lived down in Wells. Last year, it was pretty nasty for us in the winter with all the slush storms. Multiple times I had brownouts where the power started to fade off and come back on and it tripped my breaker. Now I know just to go check it and make sure I'm good to go, right? So I go out there and I flip the switch and I turn it back on. So, any more questions about the salt stuff? Napa salt stuff. Yeah? <clears throat> Napa salt stuff. Okay. Um, persistent um, uh, alkalinity um, being too high. Okay. I feel like I'm, I'm adding the down, an awful lot of down, an awful lot of down. And interestingly, I have 
low alkalinity or low pH coming in through my well, okay. I boost it up it, it, in my whole house with soda ash. Okay. And I don't know if that has something to do with it or not. That totally has something to do with it. Okay, I figured. <laughs> what I would do is I would try to fill your hot tub up with water that's not, that's not been treated by your soda ash, if there's a way to do that. Yeah, but then I have to deal with iron bacteria because I have a chlorinator. So yep. if I don't send it through the system, then I'm sending iron bacteria into my tub. So you could, you could essentially put on a pre-fill filter, yeah. which would pull out a lot of the iron out of the water. Yeah. The bacterial issue could be solved in the hot tub by just adding chlorine. I think in certain cases, you've got to essentially pick the lesser of the evils, okay. which is, you know, do I have to add a ton, a ton, a ton of down? Or, you know, do I have a little thing that filters out my iron? Then when I first fill it up, I know I've got to give it a little extra boost to chlorine because chlorine will be eaten up by anything in the water. If there's bacteria, if there's algae, if there's any growth, it will eat it up, right? And you gotta make sure that you satisfy the chlorine demand. You kill off whatever's in the water. Chlorine demand is gonna, is gonna persist until you've killed everything. So on like day one, when you fill it up, if you go test it and it's reading pretty high, you go check it the next day and it's back to zero, you gotta add more. You gotta make sure that you've killed everything off. So, all right. Boy, it's taking a little longer on this than I thought. Hopefully everybody doesn't have immediate plans to leave at 5.30. All right, so our powder, again, that's a boost on our salt system. Or if you're just using a regular chlorine system, that is what you're going to be maintaining it with. Does anybody have any more questions on the salt systems at all? No? All right. So, again, we've done our chlorine, we've done our testing, we've done our salt system, we've done our pH hardness, all that stuff. Now we get into some of the extras. And what I'm talking about there is like the shock, which you had talked about. It's an oxidizing shock. Uh, it's basically all the same stuff. It's potassium pomonophosulfate. It's a chemical that you throw into the water, uses oxygen to burn off any bacteria that's left over. People who just use chlorine non-salt systems, I mean, this is a great item to use. Typically people do it once a week, but I've seen a fair amount of people who opt uh, to do it every time somebody gets out of the hot tub. They just add a little bit of a boost and it helps to clean it up. Me? Yep, yep, totally can. So that's, that's an item that's gonna help to keep the water cleaner. It's gonna burn off any, any bacteria. It's gonna burn off a lot of the items that might've been left over that might demand chlorine, right? But it's not, it's not a testable thing, right? It's just an add-on. We've got, for the salt system, we also have your salt test strips, okay? I'm gonna talk about this just because those of you who have a salt tub, this is a little bit different of a test than the others. With this, you've got one single little of a litmus patch on there. What you've gotta do for this is you're essentially going up to the tub, taking the strip, you're dipping it in the water, kinda of let it sit there for a second, then pull it out and you're gonna to count to 20. As I'm counting, this strip is changing colors. It's going from like a reddish all the way down to a whitish. After my, 20, after my 20 seconds is up, I match it and I see where I am on this chart. And it's telling me whether I'm okay on my salt, too low or too high. It is very, very, very important to be sure that you get this right. Isn't that mostly when you, when you like change the water? Exactly. Absolutely. You're typically doing this when you change the water and you don't, Again, unless you splash a lot of the water out of the tub, you shouldn't really be needing to add any salt in between the drainings. The reason it's important to do this is if you add too much salt to the water, it's gonna make it over salty. You're gonna get all these alerts on your system uh, that are telling you that your levels are too high and having too high of a salt level, it could cause corrosion to the systems. Having too low of a salt system, it's saying it's too low and you're not gonna be able to produce chlorine to the effect it needs to be done. So again, on that initial fill, when you first get your tub, add your water, heat it up, then you add in your salt. On all the salt bags, it gives you a breakdown of gallonage per how many cups of salt you have to add. So it makes it really easy. Um, I just know, I know like by heart right now that when I fill mine up, I need about five and a half cups. And I also know that I have a little bit of salt in my water because I've got one of those salt tablet uh, purifier things at my house. So I know that I've got a little salt to start with, so I'll always just kind of test it at the beginning to see where I'm at, then I'll add my salt. There's been times where I've only had to add five cups instead of five and a half, because I already had a little bit. So 
that's really the major stuff that you'll be using. There's another item in here that's gonna be in all the tubs that are gonna be salt. If you've got a, one of the chlorine balls or whether you've got the chlorine cartridges, you're not gonna have this because it's built into it. This is called a silver ion cartridge. On your salt tubs, this works in conjunction with the salt system and the way these little, has little pellets in it. They're basically coated in a charcoal and a silver. It uses ionization to help purify the water and to break down contaminants. Now the nice part about this is it changes out at the exact frequency, essentially, that you're changing out the salt cartridge every four months. So again, our auto ship systems that we use where we just automatically send you the stuff you need every four months, that's the easiest because then you don't even have to think about it. Where's that go? So this goes depending on the tub that you've got. Some of the tubs have a, in your filter housing, you've got a little floating like bobbing a circle in there, like a ring. Yeah. There's a hole in the middle and it sticks down inside that hole. Some of the other tubs have a little housing inside of the uh, filter area where you unscrew a little tab and there's a hole in, in, the, in the center of the filter. Those, you pop this little attachment on and this drops inside of there. When we deliver the hot tub, we typically give you an orientation on like where that goes. And if anybody has any questions afterwards, I can always look up your hot tub and show you exactly where it goes. But it's pretty easy. It'll always go in the same spot every time. So typically, you're putting this in, again, when you fill it up. Um, you want to have chlorine in the water already sanitized. So you would, I guess the short answer is yes, but you're, you're already going to have chlorine in the water, hopefully, you like when you put this in. There's nothing special. So this is dichlor, oh, what's in here. Most of the chemicals that we use in all the, all the different types, whether it's smart chlor or whether it's the power chlorine, that's a dichlor. People who've had pools, you probably might have seen the big hockey puck tablets. Those are a trichlor. It's just a different type of chlorine, different type of stabilization. So if you're using bromine, you can't use that? You can't. If you're using bromine, typically people would not use that. Mm -hmm. um, bromine has its own set of, of, uh, of pros and cons. Um, I mean, bromine is bromine's a usable system. Yeah. It's not typically the, the top choice. If people have sensitive skin, they think bromine is their, is their, is their you know, choice to use. Um, salt's really the best for sensitive skin. Underneath salt, they make a special chemical that's called silk balance, which is in this little teardrop shaped bottle. That's the next best thing to salt. That's still a chlorine style of system where you're adding a little shock, but you're adding this unique proprietary mixture into the water that kind of takes care of everything and it keeps your skin super soft. So if you've got any skin irritation and your tub can't be salt, that's really what I recommend doing. It's just, it's easy and it's effective. Can you talk a little bit about foam? So, okay, so I'll get into the problems, right? Problems in general. I'll lead with foam. Foam in the water is not caused by the hot tub. Foam is caused by the people or the water that's being fed to it. People with foam in their water, a lot of times they'll call in and think that something's wrong with the tub. It's totally not. It's an issue where you've either gotten in there with a bunch of you know, soapy suits, you've gotten in there with a bunch of hairspray in your hair, you've gotten in there you know, covered with a bunch of products on your body. All that stuff causes foam. It usually happens when you invite a bunch of guests over because they probably just have their suit that was laying in their laundry bin and it just came out of the wash and so many detergents get left over from that. That's usually where foam comes from. Now, if you have issues with your calcium readings, on there with your hardness readings, it is possible to create foam from that. It's just how, it, how the water is affected by it, but that's not as common. Usually the foam is caused by not you know, rinsing off, having too many detergents in the water. Okay? If you have that issue, the best way to do it is just take a little net and scrape the foam off, and it removes it from the water, and then it's gone. What about using the shock bag? I mean, that would work. Um, I've always just used the little net because it's just easy. You can just net it off and tap it. They do make a foam reducing chemical, but that's not meant to be used in salt tubs, right? Can't use that in salt tubs. You can use it in chlorine. No worries, best of luck, man. My pleasure, enjoy. Um, you don't wanna use your foam reducers in a salt tub because the chemical that's in the foam reducer can affect the salt cell. And again, that says it on all the literature we have and we'll cover all that upon our orientation with you. But 
I say that because if you go Google, how do I get rid of foam in my hot tub, you're going to get a bunch of product ads. Add foam down, add foam zero, add this, add that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Just you net the foam out and tap it. That removes it from the water. The other thing you might notice is you might have like a, I don't want to say a scum buildup because that sounds a little nasty, but it's kind of like a lotion-y oil line. That's caused a lot of times by people who go in there if they're spray tanning, if they've got a bunch of makeup on. Um, in the summertime, uh, I know I've got my kids all, you know, sprayed down with bug spray and SPF 90, you know, skin lotion and all that. That stuff comes off in the water and you end up with a little water line, right? There's no real way to chemically treat that in terms of like a, a product that just makes it go away. You really need to wipe the water line off and spray out the filter really well. In a salt system, you've got to be really careful what additional chemicals you add to the water because it affects the salt cells. They do make a couple of chemicals for chlorine systems, one of which is actually, it's called enzyme. It breaks down that matter in the water, but that's only going to work on a chlorine style system. The other thing is with saltwater tubs, saltwater tubs have a much better water management system just right out of the gate in terms of how it churns the water, how it filters the water, how it does that. Now it has to have that in order to make the salt system work. So a lot of the chemicals, in my opinion, you don't end up maybe needing them as much in a salt water system just because you're keeping it churned and filtered better. Those are really the most common things that I see is, is either foam or having some sort of like a water line in the water. Um, you know, some people bring up, well, you, what if I get sand or dirt in the bottom of it or debris? They make cool little gadgets that'll actually slurp up the sand or the debris in the bottom. It's called a spa vac. Anybody who lives out on the beach or out by a lake or if your hot tub is going to involve people walking over like a sandy brick patio or anything like that, you might want to get one of those little sand removers. Just because it's quick, it's easy, it's not really expensive, and it just helps to remove it. What about so. using a tennis ball? What would a tennis ball? Just to absorb some of the stuff. So none, not, I see what you're saying. It's not really a... A tennis ball, I've never seen anybody use. They make these products called scum balls, or they make them, it's just basically a little scum sponge that bobs around and it absorbs all those body oils that are in the water. Those are really good to use in anything, if you, if you foresee that being a problem. If you have, again, if you've got uh, a bunch of teenage daughters who are gonna be in there with their friends, uh, if you've got little kids like me and you know they're gonna be covered in a bunch of bug spray and SPF stuff, not a bad thing to throw in there. You know, cheap and extremely effective. Can you swap between salt and, and chlorinated uh, tubs? If you've got a chlorine, if you've got a tub that's capable of running on salt, yeah. you, could, you could either run it on salt or run it on chlorine, and then you can go back to salt. Like, you can go either way. There is no, like, set style. If you've got a tub that is not salt water capable, you can't make it salt. Or at least with ours, we don't have any recommendations for that. The only thing that I know of that would make a non-salt hot tub a salt tub is an aftermarket gadget you'd have to buy online, and they're not recommended by any manufacturers that I know of because they're really damaging. It doesn't have as intuitive of a salt like PPM management, so it lets you, again, run your salt too high, and it can be corrosive. For a salt tub, um, the initial setup, you're saying you add salt one to three on the test trip? On chlorine. That's where, you're gonna, that's where you're gonna want it to essentially register like week to week when you're out there looking at it. When you first fill the hot tub up, you get it up to temperature, you add your salt. Over the first couple days, you're going to want to keep it a little bit higher than that. Just because you want to be sure that everything that's in, your, in the source water is killed off. So the, once you add, you get the correct salt level. Yep. And a week later, it's so good. Until you change your water, it should, because the salt get, doesn't get burned off. Yeah, you shouldn't need to add more. Okay, so yep. the salt doesn't. It usually stays the same. I've never had to, in between my changings of water, I do mine in April and October, I've never had to add salt in between. It's always been good to go. In a salt system, when you push the, the clean button, yep. it goes on for 10 minutes, does that boost the... Uh, nope. Output? That's, just, that's just the jets. That's just the jets. Okay. That's, again, your clean cycle is just amplifying your filtration over yeah. a small period of time. And then it automatically turns off. Then it automatically off. turns yeah. off. Now that's one, every time everybody gets out of their hot tub, if you got a clean button, you should push it. Yeah. Because the dirtiest the water's ever gonna be is right when you get out. Because yeah. whatever was on your skin is just floating around in the water. So, any more questions?
Thank you very much. Great stuff. On a test Great. stretch. Yep. Hypothetically speaking, it's been sitting out there all summer next to the hot tub in a pool, and it's still there. How effective is it now, or do you need new, new stretches? That's not great. The risk to that is that the humidity is gonna is gonna alter those little like litmus strip tabs. Yeah. That's the. I'm sure you've seen them. That's the thing. On here, you can look at them, and I've I've seen it where you'll look at it, and they'll be a little spotty, or they'll be a little discolored. Okay. That's why you want to keep them in a dry area. All right. So now I wouldn't just necessarily throw them away. But maybe, you know, take a look at them and see what it's reading. Um, and then in the future, try to keep them indoors where it's dry. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? If they're in a cold, dry environment, it doesn't affect it, I would presume. Yeah. Not going to have any effect. It's, it's really the humidity or it's really the humidity. That's, that's the big killer. They, they do have a shelf life, though, right? Yeah. They, they will expire over a certain amount of time, which is, brings me to my next point. We are very diligent here about like changing our chemicals over, they're all fresh. Not all this stuff has an infinite shelf life, like forever, okay? A lot of the stuff that I've seen, you know, they make, I don't want to say like knockoff chemicals, but a lot of stuff, if it's not bought at a specialty pool or spa store, it could be sitting in a warehouse for three years, you know, before you got it. You got to be careful with that. I've had some customers who've went and bought, you know, a bottle of the cheap chemicals over at Martin's or at Walmart or whatever, and they're like, man, I had to use half this bottle and it didn't do anything. And I say, well, that's because it didn't have the same potency, right? And now you've just poured a bunch of filler in there without really any active ingredient. So the one last parting thing I'll say is if anybody ever has any questions, like our big thing here is we are truly, you know, committed to being sure you guys feel good about it, you're in good shape, there are, there are no silly questions. If you ever need something, Please don't worry about it. Just call us. Or just bring us in a sample of water, and we'll help you out. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Thank you guys Thank you. for coming in. Thank you.